this webcast today is um, on World Hand Hygiene Day, 5th of May, where the WHO is promoting a very loud and clear call to action this year, which is performing hand hygiene at the point of care. So we know this is where hand hygiene can have the biggest impact on healthcare associated infections and on patient safety. So with that, I'd like to start thinking about how we look at these messages. So recognising both the leading health organisations, as I mentioned, WHO and CDC, that the simplest, most effective measure for preventing healthcare associated infection is hand hygiene. And hand hygiene has that huge impact that we understand and have seen evidence for infection. And so one thing we know is a huge challenge for healthcare uh, facilities worldwide is the fact that consistently, consistently the compliance is below 40%. And this remains a big challenge for healthcare facilities today. So with that in mind, we're going to hear how healthcare facilities from both the United States and in Europe have brought innovation into their facilities to try and address this compliance topic. So I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. So our panelists today are from both, as I said, the US and from Europe. So Stephanie Swanson is currently a manager of infection prevention at North Memorial Health, a health system the level one trauma center located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Kathy Nye has been working in infection control for 10 years at the JW Ruby Memorial Hospital in Morgantown, West Virginia, in the United States. And she's currently working in the neurosurgery service line and ambulatory service line. Anametta Iverson is a clinical nurse specialist and PhD student at the oncology department of Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark. She's focused on the importance of good hand hygiene in healthcare working closely with nurses and doctors to educate and encourage good behaviour in all aspects to improve patient safety and stop the spread of infection. And Dr. Marco Bohansen is a medical doctor and a PhD from Copenhagen University. He is the medical director for the Saninode Hand Hygiene Solution and has been part of several large hand hygiene improvement projects across Europe that have focused on data-driven performance feedback and nudging to create sustained behavioural changes. So our panellists today are going to address some of the questions we've already seen in our invitation on how you can look at innovation to bring and improve hand hygiene compliance into a facility. So to remind us of those questions and what we're going to put to the panellists today is why they decided to investigate electronic monitoring in the first place. So what value did they see in that when they brought that into their facility? How they built a business case to, into their hospital to invest in this solution, something that many of you may be familiar with. In terms of implementation, how they successfully were able to implement across their teams and facilities. And then looking at the outcomes, what clinical, financial and operational benefits they saw when they brought electronic hand hygiene measurement into their hospitals. So as we were talking about hand hygiene compliance monitoring, I'd like us to remind ourselves of the evolution of hand hygiene monitoring as we know it today. Looking at direct observation, which most of you be very familiar with, we recognize that we have different observers who observe these hand hygiene problems. And this is collected manually and usually only captures about one to 4% of all events. And we know this is subject to bias. The Hawthorne effect is something that happens when people act differently when they're being watched. So direct observation is always very valuable. And even when you bring electronic monitoring into your facility, it's often still very valuable to understand the barriers to compliance, but also to feed back into training and education for staff. When we looked at product use measurement, this is where dispensers actually, the activity of the dispensers is measured. So you're looking purely at product consumption. So results are compared to a theoretical number of hand hygiene opportunities. And therefore, the ability to be able to impact human behaviour and individual behaviour is quite low. And then finally, on the topic for today, looking at electronic monitoring, 
These systems are usually comprised of integrated systems that include badges, dispensers, and sensors. So essentially, all around that patient zone, which we know is really, really crucial, crucial because that is the point of care for patients. So this gives hospitals the ability to collect, analyze, and report real-time actionable data for their facility. And with that, you're able to also provide reminders of when to perform hand hygiene. So we're thinking about electronic monitoring systems and thinking about how they are used both in the US and in Europe. I'd like to also emphasize today that we are not going to talk about the specifics of systems as we have different systems used both in the US and in Europe. So the US has an Ecolab system and in Europe, we have partnered with Sanyudge with a system there. And this reflects the different geographies, different healthcare facilities, and, and, and different ways healthcare is delivered in those regions. So what we will focus on today is the benefits that we see from these systems and the outcomes, and that's what our panelists will share today. So with that, I'd like to open up our discussion and um, start posing some of our first questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see all of our panelists and you can feel that you're able to listen in here to everybody today. So the first question, Kathy, I'm going to reach out to you first. Um, and the first question is around, you know, how you decided to investigate electronic monitoring at the beginning. Where did you see the need? Well, as you said, the, the uh, direct observation or secret shopper or those kinds of uh, ways to look at hand hygiene are very important. However, as you also said, such a small number, a, a moment in time, um, we felt that we just weren't capturing um, hand hygiene and we felt that there was some lack of hand hygiene. Like you said, 40%, that's about what we were seeing. Um, so we um, decided we we also had an increase in healthcare acquired infections, especially C. diff, as we have seen across uh, the United States. So we um, decided to look into an electronic hand hygiene system, and after a lot of research, we did um, choose Ecolab. Okay, and and reaching out to you, Stephanie, is that something that you are familiar with too? You know, how did you how did you investigate um, in, in, electronic hand hygiene monitoring for your facility? Hello everyone. Uh, we had a very similar experience to Kathy's facility. Um, for us in our hospital, we were fortunate to really have senior leaders who appreciated and recognized the importance of having a strong, robust hand hygiene program. And so for many years, we did different iterations of direct observation methods everything from having um, our infection prevention team doing audits to having leaders on our nursing units do audits, um, going to different units to do direct observations, implementing competitions uh, between units. And um, through all of that, we really could not um, kind of get beyond a, a specific threshold despite all the education, despite that our team members could verbalize and knew what the right thing to do was. So that's really what prompted us to start thinking out of the box and looking at electronic monitoring systems. And um, fortunately for us, right around the time that we really were strongly considering this is when Ecolab um, launched their product version. And you mentioned senior leaders within your organization. I'm gonna I'm gonna lead you to the second question um, because you know, there, there are people within organizations that, you know, when you look to business case that you need to engage. How did you bring your senior leaders into the discussion and, and show them the value of innovation such as this? Well, as I mentioned, we were fortunate that our senior leaders really had an appreciation, a recognition of the importance of hand hygiene. We didn't have to sell them on um, even that simple message of improving hand hygiene is going to make a difference for our, our infection outcomes. They really recognize that. But um, the important thing here was this was going to be a, 
a very large project specific process change that would require a lot of resources. And so the way we really brought this concept in is we wanted our senior leaders to understand and actually observe and see an electronic monitoring system in, in use and see it firsthand with our own eyes how it functioned. So we brought uh, a demo in very early on and um, really had all of our senior leaders, all of our um, influencers in the organization who could really help make a decision. We felt it was really important that they saw it working in action. And um, it's very easy to understand the concept once you see it working. And um, that was, I think, a really critical step for us. And I, I would um, really recommend that you get those people that influence in your organization to see the system working, um, have the opportunity to see it, feel it, ask questions um, in person if possible. That's great. Thank you, Stephanie. And Anna Mehta, I'm going to come to you to you next. Um, I know from your experience, you actually looked at innovations such as this. You looked at the Sunnyland system for, for Denmark in your hospital. And you looked at it for research purposes. Do you want to um, ex share your experience on where you saw the need also? Yeah, well, back in 2015, we uh, I heard myself over and over again talking to the staff about this hand hygiene, how to improve it. And every time I talked to them, they often said that, well, I always do the hand hygiene perfectly. Of course, they could say me, but I, of course, always use the sanitizer before patient contact or after using the toilet and so. And uh, the problem for me was that I was not sure that was right. So uh, every time I worked as a nurse in the department, I, uh, I don't think that was what I saw. So, so the problem for me was that the only data we got at the time was the direct observations. And every time I, I should do these direct observations, well, we are nearly 700 employees and they could say, uh, oh, today the hygiene nurse is here, so we all need to remember to uh, use a sanitizer today. So those uh, observations was definitely that, uh, valid for me. So, so we had two major problems here. One problem was that how do I do improvement work with people that already think they are doing it perfectly? And the second was that we did actually not know the compliance level among healthcare workers at our department and we couldn't evaluate the solutions we implemented. So that was two huge problems. And that was uh, when I realized that we really needed help. So then I reached out to a behavioral expert and, uh, and got the help. Um, hmm? So understanding, like you say, behavior is such a huge in, in consideration and thinking that, you know, healthcare workers think they're doing it right all the time. Um, but when we're watching and doing those visual inspections, we can see something different. Um, next, um, Dr. Hansen, I'm going to go to you next in, in terms of your experience, um, where you also, from, from working within um, healthcare, but now as medical director of Sunny you know, what was your journey in terms of seeing the beginning and seeing that need? Yeah, you're right, Amy. Um, for me, it started when I was a PhD student at Copenhagen University Hospital. Back then, I was actually looking into something a bit different uh, about, I was investigating the immun immunological response to some types of bacterial infections. And that was, of course, interesting, but what I could see in my data as well was that almost 20% of, of my patients got these bacterial infections while they were admitted in the hospital and after they had got, undergone surgery or specific procedures. And that made me, of course, curious as a researcher, as a medical doctor, I wanted to know what is the reason behind it. So when I reached out to, to my management asking for some more data, how are we performing in terms of hand hygiene, in terms of overall hospital acquired infections, they were not able to answer um, or, or give me any data because they didn't know how the hand hygiene levels were in the organization. And uh, that was sort of the first step that made me realize, okay, we need to, to shift 
shift the, the mindset a bit. We need more data. We and what I think electronic hand hygiene monitoring brings into into this is that you get continuous data. So I can launch a hand hygiene intervention and then I can follow it over time. How much does it even have an effect? If it has an effect, where, for example, a poster or a brochure, how big is the effect? How long does the effect last? And when does it start to decrease? So I, so I actually know when to launch a new hand hygiene intervention. So that was made what was made me very curious uh, to watch this monitoring system. Thank you. And I think, you know, it's really interesting to hear, you know, from, from your perspective, how, um, you know, you saw those those gaps and you saw, you know, the fact that the, the, the data was missing, essentially. And I think all of you have mentioned that point about missing data. Um, and without meaningful data, then not being able to action or not being able to make those improvements. So thinking about the, that, that business case and thinking about, you know, the support that you brought in, Kathy, I'm going to come back to you on, on that piece because you didn't get to share it from, from your perspective. What did you do within your facility to um, to kind of engage your senior leaders? You know, what information or data did you feel you had to show them? Well, we didn't have, unfortunately, the the um, buy-in as one of the other panelists did with our senior leaders. We had to uh, do a little bit more. Um, talking and and showing um, that we really needed this so we with our infection control committee we started with them and then um, had some help doing um, some business case with uh, how much an infection costs depending on what the infection is how much how much of a length of stay um, you know everybody needs beds we're always at you know 100 percent capacity so we have people staying so long so we, we went with all those issues and um, did go then to senior leadership. And we as uh, we did bring in the system, um, like one of the other panelists, we brought it in in a few of our units to show um, the difference. And, and I will tell you that, you know, it is about 40% in the hospital. In those five intensive care units, we were reaching between 85 and 87% um, once the system was, was in place. So, um, that was pretty much the sell for us is that they could, and, and like they said, you can see real time data, you can see minute by minute data if you want. Um, so the, the senior leadership found that to be very compelling. Wow, so that's a, that's a really big increase in improvement that you yeah. saw. That's that. Yes. So that, that was your, your key point. Stephanie, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I just wanted to comment from a business case perspective. I don't think um, COVID and the experience that we've had globally um, should be overlooked as a potential opportunity in business case for facilities. Um, we were fortunate enough to have our system in place for several months before we were hit with our first surge of COVID in May of 2020, April, May of 2020. Um, so our hand hygiene rates were very consistent at about 90% when, when COVID hit. But I think um, a system like this can really be looked at from a preparedness, a pandemic preparedness perspective as well. Um, so those that are considering how to make a business case, I think um, that shouldn't be overlooked. Did, did you feel that the fact that you had had the system in place for I think 12 months maybe by that point, that, that gave you that preparedness. Did you feel that helped you throughout the pandemic? Yes, it was um, really, I would say a blessing for us. Uh, it was in all of the things that um, we're all worried about and thinking about and having to address and problem solve. Uh, hand hygiene for us was the one thing that we didn't even have to worry about. Um, during the pandemic, our data, what our data showed is that we were very, very consistent and strong in our hand hygiene program, um, running at about 90% compliance throughout our COVID surges. So um, I think that really was a, a safety net for us and um, team members were already so hardwired in their practices that by the time COVID really hit and we really got into that surge, 
it was sort of second nature. Um, and so really a, a huge benefit for us in that regard. That's great to hear because we, you know, when we hear about um, hand hygiene and how um, at times, you know, during the pandemic, it hasn't been as, as, as good maybe as it is in the past. And even with those compliance levels we're used to 40%, PPE has caused some confusion as to how hand hygiene can happen. So it's really interesting to hear from your perspective that that had already laid all of the groundwork using um, all of the insights you've got and, and obviously the training that you're able to do to keep those compliance levels so high. So I think, um, yeah, I think if we all want to learn from preparedness, that's a really, that's a really nice story to share. And so when we think about how the system um, work on the ground and think about how they're used within your facility. Thinking about that implementation phase, introducing technology or innovation often, you know, that has to be managed quite, quite carefully. Um, Kathy, would you like to share how you manage that in your facility? Um, sure. We um, had used um, the products of this company, of Ecolab, before, so that so that's one of the reasons that we we chose it. Um, we had a, um, like I said, we had a little bit of a, a, a trial phase, which I will give a caveat to that. Um, that was very difficult, and I would not recommend that because um, of the the way the system works. It's really better to go whole house. However, um, I think the big things are education of the staff um, and ongoing, the IPs, um, infection control nurses here, out on the floors with education. And we, uh, you, we have a strong uh, partnership with EVS, uh, Environmental Services, that's very important in this. Um, and um, it is now, for our hospital, it is now one of our uh, PI goals for um, one of our pillars to reach as a hospital and um, staff bonuses are tied into this. So I think with all yeah. those things, I think um, this implementation, although has had some ups and downs, um, has gone very well. Uh, we are in the preliminary phases of this. We've only just started, but um, I think that with all those things in, and, and the staff are very uh, enthusiastic about it. So I think with those, those phases, um, I think that, that that's, that's one of our reasons for success. Okay, that's great. And Marco, are you, would you like to, to join that conversation? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a comment to, to the business case part of it. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to share some experience. Now I've had a chance uh, to work with different healthcare organizations across Europe. And what I've learned is that in terms of business case, um, one size doesn't fit all, but I can see some general trends when, um, when you want to implement an electronic hand hygiene monitoring system. And what I can see is that from a management per perspective, they often have focus on two important things. And uh, the first thing is the hand hygiene compliance rates. How much do you expect to improve? Um, and it varies depending on systems. We can see in literature that at least 30% increase you can expect, but it also, of course, depends on the baseline. Sometimes we see a doubling hand in hand hygiene compliance. Uh, the second thing is um, what is uh, the expectations of reductions in staff absenteeism? Um, and the third thing is um, uh, back to the hospital acquired infections. How much do you expect a, a reduction in the infections? So if you nail these three things in the business case, then you uh, often succeed in, in, in convince the management to, to support the system. But then again, I also, even though it's COVID, um, I often experience that the management, top management, still doesn't see hand hygiene as a sexy thing. Um, so I all, often also has experienced that, that, that it comes down to do, not, do no harm. We all want to do uh, as healthcare professionals uh, what's best for our patients and for our colleagues. So it's also important when you do the business case to really understand that hand, hand hygiene levels our patient safety and healthcare worker safety indicators that, that we need to track ongoingly. 
And it's it's really interesting you touched on some some points where you know a lot of the, the outcomes that we focus on are healthcare associated infections, which are extremely important, and that's probably the, the first priority. But you mentioned some other outcomes and some other advantages, and and so you mentioned um, staff absenteeism. So that's a really an interesting aspect to consider how hand hygiene can have an impact on that. Did you want to share a little bit around staff absenteeism and what you've seen there? Yes, um, I think this is a, a really important uh, topic to touch upon because uh, it also comes back to feeling safe as a healthcare worker. Uh, once both the hospitals, all the elective procedures are opening up again, uh, we want to increase the safety both for the patients and the healthcare workers. What we can see in, in the data is that there is a um, correlation, correlation between increase in hand hygiene compliance levels and uh, a decrease in staff absenteeism. And we have seen in some of uh, the organizations we are working with uh, that are using the system, they are able to really track improvements in hand hygiene levels and then they have experienced up to a 30% reduction um, in, in staff absenteeism. But of course, they need to improve uh, significantly in the head hygiene compliance level. So, and this is something that uh, the management also listens to because that is something they can see in their budgets, um, the cost saving aspects immediately. Um, and, I, and I think that's also a valid point what the electronic, real-time measurements provide this is a new innovation um, and we have been so so slow i think in ipc uh, terms and in the healthcare in general to to embrace technology compared to other industries and sectors and here we can truly see and follow data hand hygiene levels and then you can measure upon other important clinical outcomes such as staff absenteeism reduction in in infections and, um, and uh, we can see that it really works. Um, and a lot of data are being published currently, which is really exciting. And I think, you know, what you've referred to there in staff absenteeism, like you say, it's something that hospitals are very conscious of. It's something they do measure. So often when you look at any other um, additional benefits, sometimes we can measure them and sometimes we can't. But those you, you've mentioned, clearly very measurable and clearly those improvements can be seen. So I think it, it's great to hear that, you know, we're looking at outcomes in addition to healthcare association infections, but it can have a big impact for a healthcare facility. And I think that's often, you know, really important to emphasize or highlight when you look at interventions, that there are lots of other elements within healthcare that can be positively impacted by interventions such as hand hygiene and um, so that's that's a really interesting insight um i don't know if, if that's something that um you've measured in your hospital in the us but i think um and from the european perspective that is something that we've been able to see and identify um and actually i'm speaking to customers seeing a lot of interest in that in that side of um things kathy or stephanie have you ever considered looking at that aspect um, within your facility. Yeah, this is Steph here. Um, you know, we we have talked about looking at absenteeism data, but unfortunately, we don't have a great way to capture that data at this point in time, especially in terms of um, parsing out illness versus other reasons for absenteeism. So we have not yet, it is certainly something we're interested in. We've been primarily following our infection outcomes as related okay. to this at this point. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, I agree. That's the, what we've been doing is infection outcomes as opposed to absenteeism. We haven't look, really looked into that at all. Okay. And I, I recognize it's, it's fairly new as well for, for you, but I, yeah. If you're interested, you know, Marco can share some of the, the, the research that he's familiar with and he's been part of. Um, if you wanted to see uh, how, how, they, how they've used it in the hospitals he's worked with. Um, so thinking, thinking along the, the, the kind of questions or the areas that we felt um, the attendees would be interested to hear, we talked about some of those benefits. Um, I know when, when we talked about different infection rates, Stephanie, you mentioned COVID, 
but I think you also shared where you had impact with other infections within your facility. Did you want to share a little bit of your experience there? Yeah, I would be happy to share. So we uh, primarily, in the United States, for those that aren't familiar, we do have required reporting um, at the federal level. So we are reporting our infection data um, through what's called the National Health and Safety Network. So tracking um, central line bloodstream infections, catheter-associated UTI, C. diff has been um, a, a very uh, significant trend in the United States the last 10 years. Um, surgical site infections and the like. So that's primarily what we've been looking at. Um, we looked at our CAUTI rates, our CLABC rates, and our C. diff rates um, in, in our six-month period post-implementation. Our facility has been live, uh, fully live across our inpatient units, medical, surgical, critical care since May of 2019. So we do have some good data at this point, and um, what we saw is a decrease in our CAUTI rates, our CLABC rates, as well as our C. diff rates. And uh, we were able to put a poster abstract together for that um, data, which was submitted through APIC um, here in the, in the United States. And um, interestingly, we did see our biggest decrease with our CLABC rates. Uh, about 36% decrease in that post-implementation six months. And so I think what was most exciting about that is we really weren't actively working on CLABC or had any other um, confounding initiatives that were being looked at at the same time. So it really did seem to be driven by those hand hygiene practices. Wow. And so your APIC abstract then is, is obviously then publicly available. So we can share with the attendees, they can they can see which publish on those. But that, that really is truly significant improvements that you've seen. And um, but as as all of you and many of our attendees who are familiar with hand hygiene, we know hand hygiene has that big effect. And it's great to see that additional evidence and great to see that build of evidence that's really supports it. So in your facility affecting your patients and affecting those infections. That yeah, that's a really powerful story. So, Anametta, I'd like to bring you um, into the conversation in terms of your your research um, and your facility. Did you feel there's any similarities with what you have done in your facility, and what you've heard from Stephanie and Kathy? Well, uh, the way we use the data at the, uh, right now is that we. Uh, uh, trying to investigate uh, the, the effect of uh, different behavioral um, interventions. So uh, I do not have any results yet to share, unfortunately. But uh, what we're doing at the moment is that we, uh, we have implemented the system in nursing homes and in, uh, in the hospital. Uh, and we're trying now to see the impact of uh, light-guided nudges, meaning that uh, what happens when, uh, when the staff uh, sees a light on the sanitizer, when they pass the sanitizer, and what happens when they see a light, a green smiley light, um, after they have used the sanitizers. Does that have an effect? In another st uh, study, we try to investigate the effect of um, um, group feedback, meaning that the leader once a week use five to ten minutes to give in, in feedback to, uh, to the staff. That could be the nursing, the nurses, uh, where the leader will tell about how is uh, your data, for example, in the patient rooms last week, they could talk about uh, why, is it why is it difficult to remember to sanitize before patient contact. Uh, could we do something? The nurse could say that uh, the sanitizer is often empty, and then they have a discussion of what to do about that. So that's also an intervention we uh, investigate at the moment. And because we have this huge amount of data, we are able to evaluate the effect. And that's the, a very strong part of this uh, monitoring system. Yes, so all of the measurements, you know, all that data that you're generating is clearly giving you a lot of insights with that. And I, yeah. you mentioned that, that nudging piece, which is, you know, giving, giving healthcare workers that prompt um, we know intentionally they don't want to ever forget to do hand hygiene, but you know we're very familiar with healthcare workers saying they're busy and they're trying to remember how hand hygiene fits in their workflow. Um, so I, I'm familiar with that that 
nudging theory where it, it gives that small prompt um, and, and can be very effective. Marco, I think you also, you know, from your perspective in the, in the technology that you have, um, that's something that you can share, share a little bit on as well. Um, yeah, sure. Um, we call it um, light guided nudging. So there are many different different ways you can nudge people to change behavior. Um, and you can, for example, use light. And what we can see in different healthcare organizations is, is that when you are using lights, in as Animeda explained, is that it's important also to, to sort of um, switch it on at the right time, at the right moment. So by using electronic hand hygiene measurements, you can look in different walls, different departments, and then the IPC team or the, um, the department management, they can see perhaps see a decrease in one of the departments. And that is then where you want to switch on the light guided notching. And then the increase, the awareness started, starts to increase and then compliance levels uh, also increases. And then you switch it off again because you don't want to create too much friction uh, and you don't want to create poster blindness. So, uh, so the, the stimuli, you want to close that off after a certain time, but then you can see in other words, then compliance level starts to decrease and then you can switch on the light guided notching in these departments. So it's my experience is that if you use it in a clever, in a smart way, the notching, then it has a, a huge impact on the awareness part. Thank you, that's, that's great. I think um, in terms of what we wanted to, to hear today from all of you in the, in the panelists and the questions that we posed, you know, I think the, the insights that you've shared on you know, similar aspects on where you saw the gaps, where you saw the needs to bring innovation and technology in to help. We weren't getting enough data or you, can, you can't capture hand hygiene moments that sometimes not visible. Um, but also, you know, what you've shared around the business case or engagement of staff. So that's both, you know, staff using hand hygiene, engaging leaders, engaging, you know, how you bring in this technology and how you've implemented it has been really, really insightful to kind of see and hear and share your experiences. Um, before we move on to any of the attendee questions, I would like to, to open to all of all of you if you would like to add any final remarks um, or comment on what each of you have shared. Um, so I'm going to end this bit as I started. Cathy, I'm going to go to you first. Is there anything you'd like to share finally before we um, listen to some questions? Yeah, there is one final thing. Um, I think that, you know, we talked about um, leadership being involved and, 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 and buying into this. But I think one um, group that we have found that's very important is our physician group. Um, when we have buy-in from our physician group and our residents and interns um, and our physician leaders, that's when we started seeing a real change and a real difference and um, a more compliance, even before the system. But um, I think that, that that is essential to have your physicians as team members and partners. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, making sure as well, you, if everybody on board is so keen, you don't leave anybody out, right? So it's, yeah, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, Stephanie, would you like to share any final thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would echo what Kathy is saying. Of course, you, you don't want to leave your physician partners out of this process. Um, when we first implemented, one of our biggest complaints, vocal, our vocal groups were our physicians who really felt that in the direct observation method, there wasn't enough data. The end size was so small despite having, um, you know, several hundred observations a month. When we implemented the electronic monitoring system in the first six months, we had over 2 million observations. So um, you do get a lot of data to work with, which is uh, both a positive and a, a negative because you do have to decide how are you going to use all that data. Um, so if you're considering using a system like this, 
I would just um, recommend really having a focused scope on what you plan to do with that data, what you plan to act on, because um, you can sort of get this data paralysis because you now have access to so much that you didn't have before. Uh -huh. And I do like to joke now, I like to go back to our provider groups who were vocal about not having enough data before. And now I can say, is 2 million data points enough for you now? So. And of course, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And actually, um, I'm going to stick with you, with Stephanie, because I have another question um, before I move on to the next one. So we heard um, from Anna and Marco a little bit about the system they've described, the system used in Europe, um, the Sunny Nudge system. So I know um, temptation is to talk about how it all works, um, and we were trying to make sure that all of the attendees could could hear about your outcomes, but the system you're familiar with in the US, um, would you like to give a, a quick overview really about how it's used in the badges um, and whether you use it both on soap and sanitizer? Is that something, Stephanie, you, you'd like to share about your experience? Sure. Yep. With the system we're using, uh, the badge system, a wireless badge system. So the badge that the um, team member or employee wears, it talks to your dispenser and um, hand hygiene is measured at the point of use of the dispenser. And then as they um, enter their direct patient care zone, so, you know, roughly a, a small about 12 inches around the patient is actually the point where um, compliance is measured for that individual. And um, we are utilizing this um, in both our alcohol-based um, sanitizer as well as at our soap dispensers as well. Okay. So in terms of C. C difficile, you know, where our policy in our facility is uh, preference is hand washing for C. difficile. So we can uh, parse that out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really crucial, isn't it, to make sure that those differentiations can be made. Um, Marco, I would ask you the same question um, in terms of the, the, the system with Sunny Nudge um, about that whole soap and sanitizer. I think that's often a, a question people have. Yeah, the important thing is that data is being analyzed automatically and it's placed in an easy, understandable way. So you don't have to be afraid if you're not that data driven. Um, that you can also have data explained in an easy and actionable way. And that's also important for me to say. And that's at least our focus once we um, engage with healthcare organizations and look at the behavior. It's really important when you talk about uh, behavioral psychology to be as specific as possible and use examples. And that is what we that is where we use the data. For example, to focus on before the patient contact or after patient contact, or what is the compliance in the medication room compared to staff toilets or where, wherever the, the sensors are placed. Thank you. And and as I see lots of questions coming in, I'm going to lastly go to Anna just to see if you would like to share any final comments on your side. Yeah, I would like to add to, to what Michael just said that the it's it's important to remember that the system collects data, but it, that does make a difference itself. So you need to have a, a leader that supports this to prioritize time to use the data in the clinic, clinical practice. Otherwise, it would won't uh, help anything. So, so what we experienced here was that uh, nurses, especially and cleaning assistants, they are not used to look into data. So, so it was important in the implementation. Uh, part for us to uh, to inform and educate the these groups uh, about the system. We need they needed to have a, an understanding of how the system works and then, and uh, the basic algorithms. Also, uh, first when they had this uh, this information, they were able to work with the data. Um, and the first question that that I have. Um, Kathy, I think it might be a good one for you. You talked about um, uh, areas of the hospital to test. From, from what I remember you saying, you tested initially in the ICU. In the, was that a good place to test in your experience? Uh, um, yes, it was a good place to test. Um, it, it's just that this, you know, obviously the system that we're using 
uses a, a, a sensor or a beacon on the bed as well as in the hand sanitizer and soap. So we found it, we had a challenge of if a patient was um, discharged or, or, or well enough to go out of the ICU to a step down our floor, the bed would typically go with them, even though we tried not to do that, but it would. Mm -hmm. and so then we would have um, uh, non-beacon, non-censored areas um so it, it was that was a difficult part um so i would suggest if you know you were going to do it that you know that up front that the bed should not move and that was honestly that was just kind of a we, we missed that point so um <laughs> but i think the icus in, indeed are are a very good place to do it yes and did you capture all of the employees there or did you identify certain groups we we could you know we're a big um uh, teaching hospitals, so we couldn't do everybody. So we decided, um, as a as an institution, to do the um, nurses and and nursing assistants and phys physical therapists, um, respiratory therapists, and intensivists just mm -hmm. that work in those areas. Mm -hmm. And anybody else, we just knew they were not they were not badged. So we just we that was the group that we decided on. Now everybody is now. Now everybody is now. You brought yeah. it back to the whole hospital. Okay. Yeah. And Annemette, uh, the, the same question to you. Um, when, when you used the system, did you identify certain groups or did you use it for all employees? Uh, we use it for doctors, nurses and cleaning assistants uh, at the hospital and nursing homes. So uh, what the... Uh, what we thought about before we implemented the system was uh, how the how the staff would feel about uh, using a badge like this. We have a, a sensor in our name tag here because in in Denmark we are we don't like being watched or monitored. Uh, so I don't know if it's the same as in the in the state, but but that was um, we we thought about a lot about that. So we we um, decided that we wanted to. Uh, to say to the staff that, that it's up to them to decide if they wanted to be a part of it. But what we experienced okay. was that uh, most of them wanted to be that. So, so Interesting. It's, uh, yeah, it's not a problem to uh, to have participants using this uh, this batch. Yeah, because we often think healthcare workers may not like the idea of it, but it it sounds like that engagement was was there that they that they very much wanted to be part of it. And, and actually, um, to that point, in terms of managing perceptions of staff implementing the, the system, Kathy, from your experience, I know yours is relatively new. Did you, how did you manage that within your facility, um, managing staff's perception and, and the introduction? It, it, it was an issue. I mean, in the United States, we are the same way. Um, you know, we don't like to be watched. Mm -hmm. So um, we did have a lot of education um with the staff um that it is you know it is me measuring hand hygiene only it's not a tracking system especially ours is not it's mm -hmm. not a staff tracking system it's just the hand hygiene system and once that was um disseminated through the staff we didn't have any more issues with that okay and the same to you stephanie what about your experience with staff engagement Similar to Kathy um, and Anametta, uh, you know, the first instinct is people don't want to be tracked or monitored, especially um, when there's this belief, you do get the comments of, well, I do hand hygiene all the time. I don't need to be tracked. So we became very intentional about how we messaged, how we educated and trained to the system. We never called it an audit system, a monitoring system or a compliance measuring system. What we started using is um, a hand hygiene reminder system. And we consistently use the example of when you get into your car and you forget your seatbelt, you get the blinking light. It's a safety mechanism, a safety net. Um, and so that's really how we are messaging to our team members now is that it's a safety reminder system, just like your seatbelt reminder system in your car. And that um, I think has been uh, pos positively received. And I really like that you've touched on language. Um, you know, we hear that in with colleagues, um, and and I know some KOLs who work within WHO, worked in hand hygiene for a number of years, 
and a really focus on that language piece. It's so important in how you engage with hand hygiene because it's such a it's a, just a human behavior that you know how you deliver it and the language that you use um, because essentially you're trying to encourage them to do the right thing, right? But I really like that way that you've kind of made sure you use something that engaged them and made sure they didn't feel that, you know, like you said, that getting over the issue, they feel they may be watched. And, and I really liked your analogy. You know, the, the seatbelt thing is, we all, we all know that we would never drive a car without a seatbelt. But that, you know, it's just that, that reminder. I think that's a really nice way to put it. Um, so I think um, looking at um, suppliers, so looking at um, suppliers like, like Ecolab, how can we help you build that case for investment? If any of you would want to kind of address that piece, we talked a little bit about business case. Um, so what some of the information and data and analysis, um, how can we help you with that? Um, we heard a little bit about the data that you've generated, but is there anything you feel um, as a supplier we could support with? And if any of you would like to answer that question. <laughs> no, it's too shy. <laughs> I think I think for you know for us. We always want to make sure that we can support our customers as much as possible and recognizing that's a hurdle. So yeah, that's a, an interesting question from yeah. uh, from the audience. So Ben, Ellie, uh, Go ahead. Our experiences um, from different hospitals in Europe is, is, for example, what is really crucial is support in the beginning of implementation that um, that that um, that you provide the information at the right point of time. So so there are some crucial steps in implementing a system uh, like this. Um, we need some good information to the healthcare workers uh, before um, the system is is being installed. Good information before they start to wear a a Sani ID, the sensor on the name badge. Um, and then good information just before you start to do the data uh, presentation uh, meetings and the improvement work. So there are some crucial steps here that I see as uh, as important and where you can um, support um, and that would actually help uh, getting a success with using such system. Thank you, Marco. And I know that's something that you've done quite a lot of, so it's really interesting to hear from, from your point. Um, so with that, I would like to um, thank all of our panelists today for giving their time um, for answering all these questions and really addressing what we felt was a really important topic when we think about electronic and hygiene measurement. You know, how, how are those um, on the ground consideration? How do you think about staff? How do you think about engagement with senior leaders? Um, I want to really thank you for your time and your insights today. Um, on a final on a final point from Ecolab, um, for all of the attendees who've come on today, um, I would like to be able to we would follow up with you. We can have a recording of today's webcast and as well for the for the panelists too. Um, that would be available in a couple of days' time, and so you can share the recording of today's event if you'd like. Um, we would also provide any answers to questions that were raised that we didn't get to today. So if you've raised a question and it was not answered, we can follow up with that as well. Um, and so we will come back to you with those answers. Um, we've also heard a little bit from um, some of the published research and some of the outcomes that our panelists have shared. If you're interested, we can also su supply the links to their work so you can understand a little bit more of what they your work looks like and their research. And then finally, in, in terms of, you know, we've heard, we've heard about the outcomes of the system today. If you'd like to understand some more detail um, of both systems in the US and in Europe, we're more than happy to provide that to you. And so any of that information can be made available to you to, to research and to learn a little bit more. So thank you all to the attendees for your time and attention. And thank you to our panelists. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.